We're just trying to change the world here, people. Oh, really? If you wish to make an apple pie from scratch, you must first invent the universe. If you're scientifically literate, the world looks very different to you. It's not just a lot of mysterious things happening. There's a lot we understand out there. And that understanding empowers you. If you base medicine on science, you cure people. If you base the design of planes on science, they fly. If you base the design of rockets on science, they reach the moon. It works, bitches. That's right. Science works, and sometimes it tells us things that we don't want to know. Welcome back to O'Reilly Radio 151, recorded Friday, April 14th, 2017, where we dismantle the current events for your entertainment through mostly rational conversations that make you go O'Reilly. I'm your host, Andy Cowan, and I still have my usual suspects. I've got Stephen Griffith, Amber Besecker, and Daniel Atherton. Welcome back, everybody. Again, we make mistakes, so please call us on it if, uh, if you find something that we have gotten completely wrong or you just like to present another idea or another voice out, out there for us, please go ahead and let us know about it. Or really radio podcast at gmail.com or phone it in at 470-222-6759. We'll also take text messages, so if you can do it in uh, more tweet style, feel free. And I'd also like to thank our $5 patrons out at patreon.com slash O'Reilly Radio. We've got Donald Davis, Melissa G., Henry and Daniel Duncan, who are getting our show notes immediately and also getting uh, show content, the in-between stuff and the pre-show and all the dirty stuff that the rest of you aren't going to get. So you never know what's going to be out there. All right. So um, <clears throat> things that, uh, that we got some bad news. Got some bad news this week. The Great Barrier Reef is now listed as in terminal condition. I don't think there's any way to spin that other than shit. Congratulations, we are, we've killed something that is 25 million years old. Yep, approximately 1,500 kilometers, or I'm sorry, yeah, kilom- kilometers. <laughs> yeah. Of 2,300 kilometers total is now bleached. The reef will take a decade to recover. Uh, given it has a year or so of no bleaching to recover it now. Um, Quote, it takes at least a decade for a full recovery of even the fastest growing corals. So mass bleaching events every 12 months apart uh, offers zero prospect of recovery for reefs that were damaged in 2016. And on top of that, this is the second consecutive year in a row that it's happened. And as far as we know, that's the first time that's happened. Um, yeah. Water quality expert John Brody from the James Cook uh, University admits the reef is now in a terminal stage. Quote, we've given up. It's been my life managing water quality. We've failed. Lead researcher Terry Hughes showed the results of an aerial survey to his students and wept at the devastating mass bleaching that has occurred over the past two years. This year, Cyclone Debbie hit parts of the Great Barrier Reef that were largely untouched by bleaching bleaching events. Clearly, the reef is struggling with the constant uh, rise in water temperatures. Without a shadow of a doubt, global warming is responsible for the catastrophic damage done to the reef. Uh, quote, one degree Celsius of warming so far has already caused four events in the past 19 years. Ultimately, we need to cut carbon emissions, and the window to do so is rapidly closing, said Hughes. The reef will never be the same, and future generations will never experience the reef in its full glory, if at all. It's pretty bleak. We have a legacy in this country, partially given to us by Teddy Roosevelt for the pres- preservation of natural spaces, beauty, the wonder that man cannot himself create. As man has acted selfishly, we are destroying those spaces. And it is up to us to undo the damage that we have caused. 
This is um, neglect on a global scale. Because we, we have issues with scale. We really do. You know, we are people, we are a species that is designed for the middle. You know, we, we are not microscopic, so we cannot understand the very small. We are not the size of a nebula, so we cannot understand the very, very large. We are in the middle, in meat space here. And when numbers get very big, either positive or negative, our brains have a real hard time wrapping our, our hunter instincts around it. We don't get it. Not, in, not instinctively, we don't get it. It takes some work. And, well, we seem to be averse to doing some intellectual lifting on things. And we would like it to be someone else's problem. Because well, I don't have no Great Barrier Reef in my backyard. People, people that have never traveled more than 15 miles from where they're, where they're raised have very little call to understand the plight of people in another country or the plight of a species that they've never witnessed with their own eyes going extinct. Mm -hmm. And it's a failure of education, I think in large ways, you know, they're simply not exposed to it. And no matter how many outreach events we do, if we don't properly fund it and value it as a core of what our culture and society is, we're going to continue to lose the world around us and we're going to lose these great treasures. But not, not only is it just an artifact of, of beauty, it is a tremendous natural resource of so many species that only exist there that are all doomed at this point. And I, I kind of have to say doomed because unless... Huh, I was about to quote the Lorax, but, <laughs> you know, un unless we change our minds and change what we do everywhere all at once it's not going to get better it's just not so write your congressman hit them in the face with a pizza you know something something to get their attention um, but even then they did not grow up with the values that would make this important to them. And I really hope that anybody that's listening does understand that this is something that is important and, has, and you've passed that knowledge on to whatever offspring or wards you happen to have so that maybe they can at least understand that the world is a very valuable place to not just... Not just the scientists, but to the people that actually live here. You know, that I was I had great hope for chaos theory to get people interested in complete globalization of everything. You know, wind currents in Madagascar suddenly having some effect on the the rains in California, you know, things, things of that nature that it's all connected, but we're profoundly disconnected. And I don't know how to plug us all back in, except just to keep saying that we need to, and to try and entice those values, to tease them out Pl of people. Plugging in takes ambassadorship. It takes someone of immense charisma and proper monetization, because let's be real here, Yeah, mm -hmm. to impart that, that love 
and have it grow beyond just a, a parent to child sort of exchange. Because I know a lot of my appreciation of nature comes from my family and their relations with it. Mm-hmm. Um, but at the same time, I had further support from other figures. Uh, Jack Hanna, Steve mm-hmm. Irwin, um, hell, just even going David and interacting with your local zoo, aquarium. Mm-hmm. These things help engender appreciation of the other species on our planet. And they're necessary for our existence and appreciation of life. And if we do nothing, we're screwed. We do not exist in a vacuum. I, uh, I remember being very young and reading through encyclopedias because that's what I did for fun as a child. And um, coming upon, because uh, wolves have always been like really near and dear to my heart as, um, as a species. Um, and coming across uh, the thylacine, the, the Tasmanian tiger, Tasmanian wolf, um, and read and like seeing the pic, they had like a black and white picture of it, and they were, you know, obviously describing it. They have some film um, of it too. What? They have some film There's of it as well. Yeah. yeah, yeah, they do. Um, but uh, which I makes me cry about it. every time I see it. Yeah, I came to the bottom of it, and it was like extinct, and I was just crushed um, as a as a kid. So I think, you know, that was something that made me way more aware of like our impact on the world around us that and the the other thing that always got me was how many species we eliminated in in the coliseum um by using them as entertainment to uh have them kill gladiators or to have them kill each other and we just wiped out so many species of animal doing that um, Those species of lion no longer yeah. exist and so it was learning things like that um, that that really impacted me and, and made me look around um, and, and kind of be aware of the endangerment of various species. But that was information that I stumbled upon. That's not something that was e- that I was ever led to or something that was ever made a priority in my education. So I think that, yeah, we do need to step up our game as far as making children especially aware of this because the kids are next. That's our future. Mm-hmm. Again, for, for anyone older, just, just keep in mind, voting age in, in this country is 18. Mm-hmm. 18 years is a short time. Mm-hmm. Truth, it's, it's wickedly short. All right? So they're going to be making choices that affect not just, you know, you at the local level, but globally as they participate in what, what, whatever system of government we have. And so it is our duty to each other. It is our legacy to raise these kids with an appreciation of life in all of its myriad of forms, beautiful and creepy. All right? Mm-hmm. And we do a terrible job of it. Mama Van in the chat room says, I was trying to explain our role in climate change to my ex. His reply was, we are not that powerful. Crap. <laughs> Um, I have heard that it, argument it, before many times. Yeah, many times. Here. It only takes one the the acts of one individual to ruin lives. Plural. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. You can take your car and affect hundreds, if not thousands, of people with what you do with it every day. There's a reason why we license it. It's a weapon. It is always 
easier to destroy than it is to build. Mm-hmm. Always. Immensely you so. <clears throat> you are stronger than you think and more powerful than you can comprehend. Mm-hmm. And it's not like we're only doing it in in tiny little job lots, you know? It's not, oh, that one person over there, he's got a bonfire. No, it's all the people everywhere that are doing all these things. Well, I, and I think that's the, the problem is that people, most people or a lot of people mm-hmm. don't see it that way. They see it as like, well, the individual instead of you're not the only one who's doing these things. Right. You know, uh, a lot of those people are like, well, just because I did, you know, whatever doesn't mean that, you know, doesn't have that big of an impact. And it's like, well, yeah, but you're not the only person who's engaging in that. There's Mm -hmm. quite a lot of other people who are, too. And that all has a a profound effect on our environment. And I don't think people see past their noses enough with stuff like that, especially in America, because we are so like so, like socially globally unaware yeah. um like everything is just so america centric here that uh a lot of times we just don't see that there is a world beyond us and that we're affecting it and that you know yes other countries are are contributing to that effect and that it's not just us and that you know we all need to be taking steps to to curb that take um take the 1970s and when nixon created the environmental protection agency and what did they do it was because of the giant smog problem so lead was removed from the gasoline then we put emissions controls on the cars we added catalytic converters Within 10 years, the smog problem essentially went away. Also, don't forget, forget the uh, Cuyahoga River fire, which is when 1969 an entire river caught on fire because of pollution. Yeah. I, it's amazing that, you know, we have to go that far. And, you know, we're just talking about a couple little incidents here that, that have happened in history. And apparently, the people that have lived through them directly, talking about Mr. Trump, wants to roll back the regulations that were put into place when he probably witnessed that river being on fire. He had to breathe in the air, the the smog that was over New York and L.A. Well, yeah, and what's crazy to me about that is I just saw that picture the other day. I never knew that was a thing. I had no mm-hmm. idea if you had yeah. said L.A. Yeah. Or, but no. or uh, again, it, the, the wonderful thing is we have film. Yeah. Um, right. We have evidence. And as as, as uh, somebody who appreciates film, a lot of the, in, the the indie scene that started in film happened in the 1970s. And a lot of stuff came out of L.A. and New York. And you can tell just watching some of those movies just how bad it was. So we, mm-hmm. we have we have delightful evidence, but going slightly off topic, the rollbacks, the people who want them, they know they're in the wrong. Scott Pruitt, Trump's head of the EPA, has just requested a security his security detail to be upped to 24-7 protection. He knows he's doing stuff wrong. Same with Wendy DeVos. Yeah. They know they're in the wrong. Instinctually. Something tells them that they're not safe because of the choices they're making. Trump's approval rating... protection. Yeah, Trump's approval rating fell below 35% this week. 35%. Thirty-five percent. Obama's approval rating never dipped below thirty-eight. Trump is still within his first one hundred days in office. They know they're in the wrong. Mm-hmm. They know they're hurting the country and the globe. Yeah, and they don't. It's just profiteering. 
it's just absolute profiteering and in short term profiteering at that it is it's so short sighted all of this is short sighted cuz it'll all have to get put back because the government is there to protect us sometimes from ourselves and from selfish corporations and people that just want to profiteer. You know, the government is there to do things that don't require a profit out of it. The social welfare. Creating the interstate transit system was not a for-profit prospect. No. And it would not have ever been taken, taken on by public interest. Public interest yeah. You know, it had to be it, it had to be done by private interest, I meant. It had to be done by the government because it was a giant cost sink. But look at what it did. It was the investment that could be made in the into the country that allowed other things to happen. Which is the same reason why we have a space program, too. I mean, all the research that comes out of DARPA. All of this, you know, it's huge rewards on a lot of blue sky stuff. And government has to do that because government doesn't need to have a profit at the end of the quarter. Mm -hmm. They don't need to give you immediate returns. Right. Again, the return on investment is not something that necessarily you will see immediately. It's something yeah. that we will see as a culture, as a nation, years down the line. Some things are, in fact, immediate, though. Some things. Some things that have a great return, immediate return. Others take but decades. It's having a long-term view, having appreciation of cultural and global perspective which we have which has become a miscarriage here in the United States it's not something that happened overnight there there was for a time an appreciation of the world and our place within it but over time that has eroded to where we are now do you know where we are now? Yep. Scientists have managed to create dinosaurs out of chickens. Yep. I obviously I have to change our, our heading a little bit here because it was just a little too dark, too grim. So not that this is necessarily better, depending on how you look at it. Because this is kind of, you can file this under the... They were so concerned with whether or not they could. They did they not didn't whether stop or not they should. Whether or not they should. Exactly. <laughs> most, but most importantly, at least for Fred, it's not a robot. It's it is so yeah. bitey. Yeah, it'll, it'll, but it's a not cyborg. a robot. Yeah, cyborg it, dinosaur chicken. Yeah, you can for, take this thing out with a baseball bat. <laughs> for those of you so that are watching the video, you can see the uh, the the... the Chicken raptor, I guess, is what it is, essentially. Uh, big pointy teeth. Um, 65 million years ago, an asteroid is believed to have crashed into the Earth. The impact wiped out huge numbers of species, including most all of the dinosaurs. Uh, one group of dinosaurs managed to survive the disaster. Today, we know them as birds. The idea that birds evolved from dinosaurs has been around since the 19th century, when scientists discovered a fossil of an early bird called Archaeopteryx. Uh, it had wings and feathers, and it looked a lot like a dinosaur. Most recent uh, fossils look similar. So uh, they kept on going, and let's see here. Uh, there was a... To understand how one changed into another, a team has been tampering with the molecular process that makes up a beak in chickens. By doing so, they have managed to create a chicken embryo with a dinosaur-like snout and palate, similar to that of a small feathered dinosaur like Velociraptor. We know Velociraptors, don't we? Yes. <laughs> and the results are published in the journal Evolution. Uh, the team's aim was to understand how the bird's beak evolved because the beak is such a vital part of the bird's anatomy. It has been crucial to their success. 
Uh, for 10,000 or more bird species occupy a wide range of habitats and have specialized beaks and help them survive. You know, c- given that beaks are one of the things that actually helped Darwin with the uh, On the Origin of Species yeah. you know, project, uh, the, the Galapagos finches mm-hmm. and how diverse they were. Um, yeah. Broad and narrow beak. Mm-hmm. What is more desirable in a mate? Yep. So to begin this, they uh, to understand this, the team trawled through changes in the ways genes are expressed in the embryos of chickens and several other animals. They looked at the embryos of mice, emus, alligators, lizards, and turtles, representing many of the major animal groups. They found that I birds wonder... have a unique cluster of genes related to facial development. I wonder if the beak had something to do with the egg tooth. Oh, yeah, the egg tooth to actually get out of the egg. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Hmm. Possibly. Oh, geez, if they gave the toucan teeth. No. <laughs> hmm. It's sharp enough as is. It doesn't need. <laughs> nope. <laughs> Oh, well, you can find out more about this um, <laughs> by following the links in our show notes and uh, and find out more uh, terrifying prospects. No, you, you don't want uh, you don't want a toucan with a toucans do not need teeth. They have a beak that that is is plenty well in in maiming all sorts of things. Beak, sharp, pointy teeth. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I don't need something that flies and has the face of an alligator. Oh, okay. Well, apparently now, as we carry on, astronomers might have just captured the first ever photo of a black hole's event horizon. Daniel, did you put this one in? No. I, St- Steven? I, I, I was struggling that with, was me. with the <gasps> computer. Oh, yes, yes. You were definitely struggling there. Okay, so... Uh, Amber, would you like to like to walk us sure. through this? Uh, scientists around the world have spent five sleepless nights staring into the abyss and are hoping they've been rewarded with something that could change physics forever. The first photo of the event horizon at the edge of a black hole. If their efforts were successful, we might be on the verge of actually seeing the edge of an elusive black hole, allowing us to see if the fundamentals of general relativity hold fast under some pretty extreme conditions. If Einstein was alive, we're sure he'd be excitedly freaking out right now. I bet his hair would be sticking out on end. (laughs) The bad news is we still have a long wait in store before we know whether a worldwide telescope network was able to capture the image or not. Uh, astron- astronomers around the world have now concluded five nights of black hole observations on two black holes and need to get 1,024 hard drives worth of data from the Event Horizon Telescope's processing centers at M- MIT Haystack and the Max Planck Institute for Radio Astronomy in Bonn, Germany, so they can begin to study them. That's a lot of hard drives. Yep, they're... Uh, uh, part of the challenge is that the hard drives are located at the South Pole uh, Telescope. Can't be flown out until the end of October at oh, the close of winter. Damn it. So it won't <sighs> be until later this year or even t- early 2018 until we get some answers. Isn't it amazing that we're stuck with things like that even in today's day and age? <laughs> uh, but, uh, extreme the, weather is extreme. One of the astronomers, uh, I know Falke from... Radboud University in the Netherlands told National Geographic that even without seeing the data, any tangible observations of black holes will finally take them from mythical object to something concrete that we can study. <laughs> Love it. Yeah. So either way, it's pretty exciting. No, oh, this, this this is giddy giddy time for 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 science. Yes. Because again, the the math holds that these exist. The math does hold. It's just, we, and it's a fascinating area of of astrophysics because we know so little. Uh, they explained back in February that the telescopes works by using a technique known as very long baseline interferometry, uh, the VLBI, which means this huge network of receivers will all focus in on radio waves emitted by a particular object in space at one time, in this case, Sagittarius A, the black hole at the center of the Milky Way. 
and the second black hole at the center of the nearby galaxy M87. Combined, the telescope should achieve a resolution of 50 micro arc seconds, the equivalent of being able to see a grapefruit on the surface of the moon. Now that's some, something that's hard for your mind to grasp. Well, given that, let's, let's twist it a little bit further here. All of the rings of Saturn, as they are right now around Saturn, would fit between the Earth and the Moon comfortably. All of the planets in the solar system, if they didn't have a whole lot of room in between them, you could fit them between the Earth and the Moon. I do not recommend this, so if you do get any wishes, don't make this happen. It would be bad. It would be a bad thing. <laughs> but yeah, you could fit all of the planets in between, including Jupiter and Saturn and Neptune and Uranus, all the big ones, all the gas giants. You could fit them in between the Earth and the Moon. Space is really big. You just have no idea how really big it is. <laughs> so, yeah, that's, that's pretty impressive. Um, of course, we're looking an awful lot further away than the moon. Yeah. So that resolution is still kind of crappy, as one of the scientists actually said in this article. But it's still enough to, stu to study. So it'll be, it'll be a grand thing. Um, so yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Okay. So, uh, again, that article is out on Science Alert, and you can find the direct link in our show notes. Now, of course, we're not done with space, because, oh no, apparently the first images of the web of ghostly dark matter that holds the universe and galaxies together has been taken. Um, it's, uh, well, let me, let me just uh, toss it up here. It's, it's that thing, and it kind of... Looks like some fried eggs. Some fried eggs, some or creepy eyes, maybe in the darkness. Two eyes of a nobleness staring back at us from the edge of the abyss. I mean, I haven't been reading Lovecraft or anything. No, no, not at all. But uh, <laughs> I think you're right on there. Yeah. Um, it almost looks like the flying spaghetti monster. I mean, do doesn't everything? Says hello. Doesn't everything? <laughs> we we are all touched by his noodly appendage. Um. So picture the universe, and you might imagine a dark emptiness speckled with maybe trillions of galaxies, each containing many billions of stars. The truth is a little weirder, with apparently separate galaxies connected into vast intergalactic webs of invisible filaments of dark matter. If you find it hard to imagine, at least we can now actually see some of those threads thanks to some clever use of gravitational lensing. A team of astronomers at the University of Waterloo in Canada used the space-bending effects of dark matter to see the unseeable, combining catalogs of galaxy groups that act like lenses with catalogs of data on the light sources behind them to create a visual of their dark features. First, a refresher on dark matter. Uh, I think we'll skip it. No, but this they, is they, really they essentially made a negative. Yeah, they created a negative. It's pretty. This is pretty swank. This is clever. <laughs> this is clever. This was a thought experiment where they go, "Could we do that? Can't we? Can we? I think we can do that. <laughs> Let's do that. Let's try." So yeah, it's a it's an impressive bit of uh, of extrapolation and then really putting it all together. So um, it's a beautiful thing. Yeah, and, and it provides some tangible evidence that dark matter actually does exist as a thing. At least within gravitational space, which and we still have, we, we have a, a very tenuous grasp on how gravity works. Yeah. We, we kind have of understand of an idea of how gravity works. Yeah, we we kind of understand, you know. Some real basics, and, and we and can we, 
we can work against it real easy. We we know what to do to work against it, but it it's a funny thing how it holds the entire universe together. And then we have this entire space time thing, but let's not start down that hole. Well, you know, you anything that exists in in a space also exists in a time because everything's moving. So time and space are forever intertwined. So fun stuff. And then you get into quantum where maybe it didn't no, exist they're, they're there not. at that time. Maybe it didn't. Maybe it did or maybe it it was both there and not there. Did you look? Cuz that changes things. There you go. And that's science. <laughs> <laughs> Oi! And if you've enjoyed that science and what we've done here, and you'd like to help us out, there's a few ways. You can donate to the show through www.patreon.com slash overly radio and get early access to full show content. You can make the algorithm work for us by reviewing us on iTunes to boost our ranking. And you can use your words and tell somebody about us. And of course, engage with us. Send us messages on the social medias or the electronic mails at a really radio podcast at gmail.com. Or if you're the more talkative sort, we've got that voice line out there, 470 470- Two 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 O R L Y. That's six seven five nine, and it is always ready to take your call or your text. And if you don't like what we've done here this evening, you can contact the National Suicide Prevention Hotline at one 273 8255 Available twenty four hours a day, seven days a week. The Lifeline provides free and confidential support for people in distress, prevention and crisis resources for you or your loved ones, and best practices for professionals. Thank you for choosing to waste your valuable time on us. This has been a really radio part of the Random Acts Company. This work is licensed under Creative Commons Attribution 3.0 United States license, including the music Rocket and Pemgia, created by Kevin McLeod of Incompetech.com. Thanks, everybody. We'll see you real soon. <laughs>